studios. We have about 25 uh, people from different companies. So we have uh, people from Unimity, people from Natwatch, Micro Business Solutions, CGI, NCL, and uh, future focus in tech. So, guys, uh, to say briefly about uh, Hussein, uh, is currently the Rockstar Drupal developer. He has connected uh, through Google Hangout from Bangalore. He is going to talk about Composer workflow. He is featuring the uh, Accelerant Drupal team as a technical architect. Uh, besides architecturing the uh, uh, Drupal application, he is accountable for enforcing standards there. Uh, he is the currently uh, one of the featured contributors to Drupal community in the last couple of years. He has made a lot of patches to Drupal core and contrib module. So, According to Usain, writing code is like you know, writing a poet. I admire that Usain. On a personal note, he's very down to earth and very calm person. So uh, let's see what Usain has got to uh, tell us about Composer Workflow. Uh, Usain, you can take it forward. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Shivaji, for that really nice intro. Uh, it is it is very flattering. It's nice to meet all of you, and thank you for coming out uh, to hear me talk about Composer Workflow. Uh, so I tried to get a little bit of background on uh, you know the the attendance at the event uh, to determine what uh, what kind of uh, <coughs> what level of uh, knowledge you ha already have with uh, Drupal and Composer PHP ecosystem. Um, and uh, okay, so before I go any further, let me tell you if uh, at any time you feel uh, you can't hear me clearly, if I should slow down, let me know. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to stop me at any time. Um, so you are able to hear me right now, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, great. So, yeah, uh, so I, uh, like I said, I was uh, uh, trying to determine the level of uh, understanding you already have with PHP ecosystem. And if you already are familiar with Composer and uh, Drupal 8. Uh, but anyway, I think, you know, to keep things even, I'll start with uh, a basic understanding of what Composer is. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll walk through the presentation and then we'll uh, continue with the demo of, uh, you know, the whole topic, the Composer workflow. So I'll start with uh, sharing my screen. Uh, where's the share screen button? Oh yeah, I've not used Google Hangouts in like forever. Uh, you should be able to start seeing my screen now. Yeah, we see your presentation. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, at any point of time, if you want to contact me, I'm uh, usually active on Twitter with the handle at Hussein Web and on D dot O. Uh, slash Hussein web, you know, drupal.org slash u slash Hussein web. You can uh, reach me anywhere. So uh, we were talking about Composer and Composer is mainly two things. Uh, it is a dependency manager and it is an auto loader. And uh, uh, we will jump between these two concepts and uh, see what each of these means. Um, so a uh, quick poll here. I can't uh, see any of you, but so if you can speak out, uh, if you uh, if most of you understand what a dependency manager is. Yes, Usain. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so a dependency manager uh, is uh, something uh, that lets you define your dependencies and it will handle your dependencies for you. Uh, so let's look at uh, how you would build Drupal sites earlier. Uh, you would go to drupal.org and um, uh, you would find uh, the module you want to download or the project you want to download. And at the end of the project page, you will see a window like this, uh, which basically lists all the versions that are available for download. Uh, this is uh, from uh, views project page. You can see there is a 3.14 version available for Drupal 7. And uh, there are a couple of versions available for 6 also. Uh, so this is how you would download. You would uh, start with, uh, so let's say you're building a Drupal site. and um, uh, you you want to of course you know you probably if you're building a Drupal site you most probably need views with that so you would go start downloading views and you would place it in your sites all modules directory or maybe in sites all modules contrib directory and um, you would try to enable it 
Uh, but of course, you know, you, you, you stop there because then Drupal will tell you that you also need C tools for views to work. And so you would repeat the process. You would go to C tools project page and uh, you would uh, uh, find the version required of a C tool 7.x version. You would download that and now you can enable views module. So to do a very simple thing, you uh, just to enable a module, you have a lot of steps. And uh, of course, you know, if you are familiar with Drush, you know, now this is actually very easy to do with Drush. You would just type Drush en dash y views and it will even download views. It will download C tools. It will enable C tools and views and you, you are good to go. Right. Uh, so Drush is uh, solving a problem here, which uh, which was very apparent with uh, uh, all the Drupal websites that we we're building earlier. You know, uh, so Drush made it a lot easy. Uh, it's an uh, shell script. It's an automation tool, right? Uh, so this is how you build uh, websites today. If you're not using Drush, really, you should start using that or Drupal console, either of them. And uh, uh, you would uh, you notice the difference. You would never visit this page. Uh, I haven't visited this uh, page in a project page in ages. I only go there to find issues now. I don't go there for downloads at all. So this, uh, of course, you know, once your project grow, grows in size, it starts becoming uh, complicated to maintain everything in it. Uh, you know, you have lots of modules and uh, I'm assuming you would also be using some kind of version control system, Git probably. And all of your modules will be in the Git repository. Uh, and, and this is your typical workflow. All the modules that are required, that they are in the Git were in the repository. And uh, if you have patched one of those modules, I hope you're not hacking the core or contrib modules uh, in itself. But uh, if you have patched modules, uh, you would also be committing your patch files, probably. Uh, so all this is there. But it's still really very difficult to uh, handle uh, changes if somebody uh, you know by mistake may, makes a change to a core file or a contrib module and commits it by mistake you know if, if you don't have a very strong uh, peer review process uh, you know in your workflow you you're not going to catch each and every change you make to contrib modules and uh, you would commit that and later when you want to upgrade those modules you would break something it it happens all the time you know uh, so we have to be very careful about uh, uh, making changes to contrib and code. You know, if you want to make any changes, it has to be a patch. It uh, probably has to be an issue on Drupal.org in first place. Uh, but if it's very specific to you, it still has to be a patch. Uh, so uh, one way to make sure that, uh, you know, these mistakes do not get introduced in your workflow, you would uh, use something uh, like brush make. Uh, so this is basically a file which tells that you need all these modules, all these projects, and so uh, you know particular versions of these uh, uh, projects. So, uh, for example, uh, over here I'm saying that I'm uh, going to need uh, a Drupal version 7.43 um, and uh, views bulk operations version 3.3, address field version 1.2, and so on. And it also says that, okay, uh, for a particular module called auto node queue, I'm going to patch it with a uh, so and so patch, which is already pl uh, placed in the repository. Now, the idea is that if you're going to test your website, you're going to run rush make, which will uh, download each and every one of these modules and patch them and everything. And it will rebuild your entire site. And you will know that if something has gone wrong, even better, uh, it is a typical practice in software industry uh, that you never commit your dependencies to re the repository. Uh, so technically, the website you're building is not Drupal itself. You're using Drupal to build your website. You're using each of these modules to build your website, you know, the views module or the address field module and so on. You're using them. They are, they are not what you're building. So you should not be committing all those things to your repository. Uh, you should have a script that takes in your dependencies and builds them. And this is what Rushmake also does. Uh, it, it's basically a definition for your system. And when you want to deploy your system somewhere, uh, you would run Rushmake as part of deployment. You know, you, uh, you would uh, probably take a git checkout of whatever the tag or the branch you're going to test and then run Rushmake on that, which will build the entire website. And then you can test on that website. 
and that package whatever we have tested that gets deployed to the production that this is a very typical uh, practice in a software uh, industry uh, and this is not really followed in drupal so far but uh, of course you know with drupal 8 opening up to the rest of the industry rest of the technology landscape uh, this is now coming in you know more and more people feel the need to have something like this in uh, uh, drupal itself so we were talking about uh, basically about dependencies you know about the modules and the themes that you require to build your website so far now let's look at something else um, auto loading so if you work with drupal 7 and if you have used object oriented programming uh, i'm pretty sure you have come across this uh, thing in your info files module info files um, this is uh, a module called restful for drupal 7 um, which it's it's a pretty uh, heavy on classes and objects so um you, as you can see there are a lot of them uh, so the way auto load so let me uh, actually you know let me uh, like briefly describe what auto loading is uh, now php is a dynamic language uh, which means that uh, you know whenever you run a website it's actually going to go open the php file read it interpret it and run it uh, that's how php works now of course in your code you're going to refer to a lot of classes lot of functions and uh, you would bring in those classes and functions using uh, statements like require or require once or include and include once you know these four statements you would use one of these to bring in your files now it is very cumbersome so if you uh, in lots of classes it's very cumbersome to require each and every one of them in the beginning of your program it is uh, it is not good for performance because uh, you may not actually be needing the class that you're pulling in you know uh, it, it's a wasteful operation bringing in a file bring in a file which you're not going to need anyway uh, and it's cumbersome you know you you forget that uh, you have to require a particular class before using it and you forget uh, you forget that you have uh, you forget to require it and you get an error in its conditions uh, so that is why we have a concept called auto loading and uh, basically it means that whenever php sees a class it doesn't know about it will uh call a special function and that function's responsibility is to go look in the files where uh, you have where you might have that class so that function will load the class file and return to php and now php will probably be able to find the class and it will go on if it still can't find the class it's going to throw a fatal error and so in drupal 7 this is how auto loading worked uh you would uh, specify a list of files which contains classes and drupal will keep it in its registry and uh, it will it will keep a whole index of class names and file names so uh, whenever a php sees a class it doesn't know about it will uh, pass it on to the special function that drupal provides it will uh, look into the registry and load the corresponding file and now you have the class and voila you move ahead uh it's it's a very rudimentary te technique you know you still have to define each and every file over here again if you forget to define that file you you run into errors uh, I, i'm sure you know if you have used object oriented programming at any level in drupal 7 you might have seen that uh, you might have seen that happen so uh, now we look at php how auto loading is handled at php level uh, any questions at this point you want me to slow down or is this fine the pace we are going at yeah doing good yeah doing good okay all right so let's look at auto how the rest of the php ecosystem handles uh, auto loading uh, i'll not go too deep into this uh, but uh, there was a standard called psr0 which was later modified and now called psr4 it basically describes a set of rules uh, which uh, by which you will auto load classes uh so where earlier you needed to write each and every file now you just typically have to write one or two lines uh, which say that um if a particular class follows a namespace of so and so like for example over here we have drupal core composer if that's the namespace you see look for the classes in core lib drupal core composer you you basically just building a one to one mapping that if you find a class with so and so namespace look for those files in the same directory and the rules go on so uh, the rules basically say that uh, the file name should be the same as class name so you if you have uh, if you have looked at drupal 8 code base you will see that there are thousands of files thousands of php files 
and they typically only contain one class or one interface or one trait. Uh, that is exactly because of this, uh, because the autoloader works this way. Uh, uh, if it wants to find a particular class, it will open that, uh, it will read the namespace, find the corresponding directory, and translate the whole namespace part into the directory path and open that file. That is why you need to have one class per file uh, in uh, Drupal 8. And actually in any PHP project nowadays, you know, which uses Composer for its autoloader. So the the definition you see on screen right now, autoload, that's actually taken from a composer.json. And we'll see that in a demo as well, um, what it looks like uh, and what Drupal 8 Composer file looks like. And then we'll start talking about the workflow itself. So we, we spoke about two different things. Uh, one is dependency management and one is autoloading and we'll see how Composer handles them both. So dependency managers itself is not new. If you have used languages like uh, Node.js or Ruby, you you probably already have used something called NPM or Bundler and there are package managers or dependency managers for many other languages or they're being built. Uh, and uh, Composers, I, I think, has been influenced a lot from NPM. So if you have uh, used NPM at all, you will find Composer is very similar. Um, the formats change, of course. So now Bundler uses gem files, uh, which are basically, um, uh, I, I think, uh, closest to YAML files. Not really YAML files, but I think closest to that. NPM uses package.json, which is uh, a JSON file. And Composer as well uh, uses JSON files. Yeah, so we were talking about Composer, uh, this, um, uh, we basically uh, outlined all this. So this is how a Composer, Drupal's Composer uh, JSON looks like. Uh, so uh, you see on in the required section, so there are a few other properties like the name of the project and the type of the project, the license of the project. Uh, the, uh, it depends, uh, depending on the type of uh, uh, the component you're writing, different kind of uh, attributes are required. So if you're writing a component, name is required, of course. But if you're writing Usain, an application, name it, yeah. Usain, would it be possible to increase the font size? Uh, so this is a screenshot, but we'll actually see the demo. And uh, in that, I'll be able to increase the font size. So I think, let's see, I'll, I'll show this in the demo itself. Uh, okay. But basically, the point I'm trying to make here is that a Composer JSON is built with all the components it needs. It, it basically lists that this, it needs uh, so and so components. And yeah, let's just go to the demo. Okay, yeah. So um, this is a project I have been uh, working on. Uh, you can see this font size or should I increase this? Uh, you can increase a bit. Okay. Uh, it's... There's no shortcut to increase <laughs> over here. Uh, one second, let me find out. Control plus positive. I'm sorry, PHP storm, anyone knows? Should be control plus plus. No, doesn't work. Okay. Uh, on the editor screen, uh, you went, there was a font size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me see that again. Yeah, font 12 is there. Yeah, it's uh, can't change it because it's in, I think, distraction mode. Control and mouse. Can you say it loud? Control and mouse. Scroll. Scroll. Yeah, I think you have to press control and scroll. No, Problem. actually, as far as I know, yeah, no, PHP Storm, all this doesn't work. Uh, let me find it in. Um, why it's not. Okay, read only scheme. Okay. Yeah, I think I found it.
uh, this should be readable yeah it's good yeah okay okay all right uh, so uh, yeah so this is a application i've been building uh, it's it's based on drupal 8 uh, and uh, this actually goes uh, quite deep into the composer workflow i'm going to talk about uh, so i'll pick up drupal 8's composer file itself uh so this is drupal 8 uh, composer file and over here you can i was uh, describing that there are a few uh, properties that uh, you would define in your composer json as well uh, so you would have uh, uh, name property if if you're building a component name is required type is required in that case but if you're building an application you don't typically need all these things um you also have uh, a require statement i mean that's the that's the whole point about uh, dependency management so drupal 8 requires first of all it says it requires php uh, greater than 5.5.9 it needs um, various components of symphony like class loader console dependency injection http kernel uh, it needs all this and it also actually uses a lot of other components uh, from let's say twig doctrine guzzle uh, the whole list is over here and uh, you can also mark some components as required only for development purposes like b hat over here or php unit this is typically testing components so these are uh, features which uh, will not really go too deep into the composer uh, all the commands over here uh, but uh, this is basically just to highlight the dependency management nature of composer um, what uh, this uh, there is also one uh, point that's not really visible over here is that uh, you only list out dependencies you need so suppose your website needs views you would only be listing views not c tools so that's one uh, fundamental difference between uh, let's say brushmake and uh, composer json if you're building a website uh, using composer workflow you'd only be listing views you would not be listing c tools it's composer's job to figure out that views need c tools so it will go and get c tools as well and this applies to anything and the yeah somebody was saying something will it recursively hello uh, will it recursively actually get the uh, dependencies like dependencies of dependent dependencies yes yes it will it wasn't in this make it was a manual we have to do manual in that yes exactly yeah so that's that's one of the differences here Uh, so drush make is like just an automation script it is not really a dependency manager manager so it didn't really have all that logic uh, but composer is a dependency manager it recursively gets each and every component it needs while uh, preserving the version rules uh, so the version rules whatever you specify it will keep true to that and if something fails it will not install uh, that is why composer install takes a very long time on new uh, projects okay okay uh so we uh we then uh, yeah so we were uh, so these are the kind of version conditions you can see for example you can see php greater than 5.5.9 and uh so it basically you can you can keep running uh, anything greater than 5.5.9 so that means 5.6 that also means 7.0 7.1 so on uh and uh, tilde is a slightly different kind of uh, convention but you can safely use that uh, it's the most common thing you would probably use uh, so symphony class loader it it basically means that you can take 2.8 2.8.1 2.8.2 2.9 but not 3.0 so um, this is something uh, this convention is for semantic versioning uh, it uh, basically uh, 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 semantic versioning basically uh, follows this major dot minor dot release uh, thing, which Drupal itself is following right now. Drupal eight is uh, Drupal eight follows semantic versioning. So Drupal eight, uh, all the releases in Drupal eight, that's eight point one, eight point two, the eight point three, which will come, uh, you know, after six months, all of these uh, will be backward compatible. So if you're building an application with eight point two. you should be able to upgrade to 8.3 without any problems it is going to be backward compatible but 9.0 will break backward compatibility can so uh, if you if you are depending on components that way if you want if you depend so we are going to depend on dependency injection say on on its specific api and then we say uh, so we can't go to 3.0 blindly uh, but it it might not work there it might break things so in that uh, in that case you only want to stick with the latest in 2.x so this is where the semantic versioning uh, thing comes in place and uh, 
the, the caret, I think that's, uh, you can look it up in composer's documentation. It, it is slightly similar to semantic versioning, but no, there are some subtle differences. And uh, you can even use wildcards to specify your versions. It is very flexible. The, all the entire documentation is available on uh, the composer's website. So this is how a composer JSON file looks. And uh, once you run composer install, it will uh, it'll go through all the dependencies and place them in a typical directory called uh, vendor by default. You can override that, but by default, it's vendor. And uh, it will also generate something called composer.log file, which uh, uh, basically lists all the versions it resolved to. So you have given your versioning rules, uh, uh, say uh, 2.8, anything uh, greater than 2.8, so 2.9 or so on. Uh, now, when you run Composer install next time, it might actually pick up a newer version than what you've tested with. Right, and I mean, of course, it's software, there might be bugs, you don't want to take, uh, take that chance, right? So you would have a log file which will actually say which versions it took on install, the first install. And uh, we'll, we'll actually see that in a demo, that might be more helpful. Uh, I probably don't have... Um... Let me pick uh, some other... So uh, let's say I want to start a new application. This is this is going to be a very short demo for, uh, we'll, we'll quickly jump to Drupal after this. So let's say I'm going to write an application uh, which uses Symfony slash YAML. So this uh, this is like a shortcut command. It basically creates the composer.json and runs composer install. And uh, you'd probably not see the same output uh, if you've installed composer and seen it. You'll, um, this is a special plugin that kind of speeds up the downloads. So uh, the first time if you're uh, running composer install, it's probably going to take some time. Um, so you, you can see this over here. You, if you see this line, using version 3.1 for Symfony slash YAML. Since I did not specify any version constraints, it just pick the latest one and build a version rule uh, uh, based on some conditions. So this is my composer or JSON file for this project. The only thing is that's required over here is symphony slash YAML. And I can keep adding on to this. Uh, so let's say I also require uh, symphony slash dependency injection. So it will again modify the composer.json. It will uh, uh, add symphony uh, dependent symphony slash dependency injection and get those packages. So let's wait a minute. It'll now this really depends on the speed of internet connection also. Okay. So I was hoping that this would have some um, dependencies, but apparently not. So you see over here that these are the two components that you require. Okay. And um, it also, once you run Composer install, it also creates a log file, like I was explaining. And you typically not need this file. You do not open this file at all. Uh, it basically locks the versions that are, uh, that you, uh, that you have used. Right. Um, so uh, now if you're building an application, you would, probably be committing your log file. So uh, if I'm uh, the website I'm building for uh, uh, my, the, the Drupal 8 website I'm building, I commit my composer.log file with that. So the next time I'm running composer install, it's very quick. So uh, like I was saying that it, it writes everything to the vendor directory. I've removed it and I'm going to run composer install again. This time it's going to be very quick. That's it. It downloaded both. But if you if you had noticed the first time, it took a lot of time because it's also trying to resolve the versions that it needs to use. Okay. Uh, with me so far? Yes, Susan. Okay. Um, probably. So 
I'll, I'll just demonstrate an application. This is not a Drupal application. It's a Laravel application. And uh, let's see the composer JSON for this. Um, you probably can't see. So actually, let's get this. It shouldn't be too big. Um, I'll just uh, demonstrate how the recursive dependencies work over here. And then uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll move ahead to see the Drupal's workflow. Now, Drupal's is slightly different. I'll explain what's different uh, you know, with Drupal and why we need that. So you see, when I clone this, I already got the composer.log file. Because like I said, because it's an application, I commit this with it. So now I'm just going to run composer install. Now. Uh, if you run composer install on this, okay, yes, this requires MongoDB, which my machine doesn't have. So we'll uh, let's let's just skip this. Let's just uh, I can't think of any other application right now. This particular application requires MongoDB. So actually, if you, you see now, I can even specify that I need the MongoDB uh, extension, um, and uh, composer stopped because MongoDB is not available. So Composer even uh, does all that. It checks for what extensions uh, you need uh, for the project. Not just the dependencies, not just the PHP dependencies, but the extensions itself. So uh, let's uh, go now to the Contrib Tracker project. And uh, now we will see what's different with uh, Drupal. So all this uh, components that we're picking up so far it comes from a uh, place called packages.org. So when you have symphony slash uh, YAML, uh, this is where it knows that, okay, symphony slash YAML is over here. It, it's available. And these are the versions that are available for symphony slash YAML. And you can download it from so-and-so place. Packages tells everything. Now, Drupal modules are not on packages. Uh, some of them are very few. Uh, but uh, I mean, of course, that requires that we submit everything to packages which nobody wants. Even uh, Drupalers don't want it. And even packages uh, owner doesn't want it. You know, it, it uh, kind of messes up the whole namespace. So uh, we built our own packages for this. And it's at uh, drupalpackages.org. Uh, we have, uh, over here, you can, uh, uh, so uh, first of all, you need to say that uh, you, you need this packages instead of the normal one. So that that will be the first definition in our composer.json file. I'm saying that the, I also need a repository from packages.drupalcomposer.org. OK, now once I start using this, I have modules like, like I was saying, Drupal slash views available to me. OK, these are the versions you can see on the right hand side. These are the versions that are available to me. And it requires Drupal slash C tools. That was our uh, thing. That was our problem in initially, right? So uh, now this is Drupal eight. Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't. We have views in core. Uh, so there are other dependencies over here that we need. So uh, some of the modules I'm using is like config installer, Drupal slash flag, Drupal slash field permissions, and so on. And these are available on this packages. Uh, so it downloads them and. Uh, by default, it will place them in vendor directory. Now, that's where our second problem comes up. We, we can't use uh, modules and themes and everything in the vendor directory. Drupal doesn't look there. Uh, you know, in uh, Drupal 8, we place everything under modules directory or themes directory. Right? Yeah. So that is why we, uh, I'm sorry, uh, anyone had a question? Yes, I did. OK, yeah. So. Um, that is why we have a second part to this. We we have we include a special plugin called uh, we include a plugin called uh, component called um, uh, yeah composer slash installers. So it uh, basically lets you specify um, where each type of project should go instead of vendor. So if the project type is Drupal core, it needs to go into Dockroot slash core. If the project type is doc, Drupal slash library, uh, it goes into docroot slash library slash name. So uh, over here, you can see that the modules I'm using for this project, like uh, I probably you can't see, but uh, the, you can't read it, but you can probably see it. 
uh, that I'm uh, the modules like admin toolbar, better exposed filters, field permissions flag, and inline entity form. They're placed into contrib. Similarly for themes, I'm using Bootstrap here. So Bootstrap is placed into theme slash contrib directory. Uh, and uh, now there is also another thing over here. Uh, Drupal 8 itself has modified itself for the composer oriented design. Uh, so if you remember in Drupal 7, you know, if you download the Drupal 7 zip file or tar file, you would have uh, an index.php, of course, that's your entry point. And you would have directories like includes and uh, uh, modules and themes and all that. Now, these are all Drupal's components itself. You have Drupal's modules in this modules directory and Drupal's themes in that themes directory and so on. Um, over here, Drupal 8 has completely uh, separated itself from the entry point files. So you would have files like index.php, robots.txt and all these things. They are in the root directory. But all the code, uh, all the actual, the substantial code for Drupal 8 is an inside core. And uh, this Drupal packages project, which I uh, showed earlier, they have split it out. They have uh, uh, separated Drupal slash core, a separate uh, project, which only contains the contents of core directory. You can see it over here. Um, you can search for it in the packages and you can see it on GitHub. There is a script here, which basically just takes out the core directory and puts it as the repository. Okay. Uh, now, so what this, what this does is that when you see, uh, so actually there are two ways you can go about this. You can, you, you can, there is a component called Drupal slash Drupal as well. Uh, I, I really recommend that you don't use it. It's just going to create confusion for you. Now, if you say Drupal slash Drupal, it works in the conventional way. It will get all the files, index.php, robots.txt, and so on. It will get that for you. Uh, but if you have upgraded Drupal 7 before, uh, if you run rush up, you remember it overrides your HTT, HT access changes, right? Your robots.txt changes. Uh, sure. So you would have to keep in mind that, okay, I should not over, uh, I should revert those changes, you know, and it would be easy if you're using Git or something. It's easy. Uh, but now you don't even need to do that because with Drupal slash core, you're only getting the core directory, the things you should never change. Okay, and you would not even, uh, in my particular model, I'm not even committing those. In, uh, uh, I'm running Composer install and deployment. So I'm, my repository is very clean. It does not include uh, Drupal or any of the modules you see over here. Only the custom modules I have written, it includes only that. Okay, uh, so uh, let's let's uh, go on. So now, uh, actually, you, now you get the core directory, true, but you also need the index.php files and everything, right? You, you still need that. So there is, a, again, another component called Drupal scaffold, which gets all of that for you. Uh, so you don't need to worry about so much if you're thinking that it's too much to remember. Yeah, you don't need to worry about all that because Drupal packages uh, gives you the complete... Um, let me find that repository. Drupal packages gives you the complete... Uh, uh, template for to use. So uh, it's at github.com slash Drupal composer slash Drupal project. I, I'll pass on all these links uh, later uh, so that uh, Shamal or someone can share them, Shivaji. Uh, so it, it's basically as simple as this. You'd run this command uh, uh, over here. It's a composer command again. So composer create project Drupal composer slash Drupal project. And it will create the whole template for you. It'll even install it. It will create the composer JSON with all the uh, dependencies. Uh, uh, the dependencies I was talking about, uh, uh, like composer slash installers, it'll, it'll do all that. And now you can start using it uh, on your console. You would have, uh, uh, where is it? Yeah. You would have uh, your composer JSON, you would have your composer lock and uh, a web folder. I've modified it uh, slightly to include a doc root folder. But uh, by default, it's it's called a web folder. Now, if you want to download a new module, so let's say I want to uh, use um, rules, okay, and uh, I want to use eight dot x and three uh, dot x, whatever comes over here. So I, let me say that I want dev release uh, rules. I I don't think so has a stable release. So this is the command I run. 
compose the required Drupal slash rules. If you remember, I ran a, ran a similar command for Symfony slash YAML and everything. So this is actually uh, Composer uh, requires, since it runs install again, it takes slightly more time than just install. And by the way, if there are errors over here, it will uh, it will prompt and it will revert the entire operation. So there is no loss. Uh, you, you would not break anything. It will just revert all the changes to Composer JSON and the vendor directory and whatever. And you can see in Composer JSON that it has added the rule, Drupal slash rules uh, 8.3.x dash dev. So now, uh, once the command completes, you would have rules module over here, contrib, and then you can use Drush or the UI to enable the module. Uh, those are the parts. Uh, again, it's a two-step process. You download the module using Composer and then enable using Drush or UI. So that's something we are actually working on to make it uh, simple. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. But uh, the benefits of Composer approach already outweigh all these uh, issues that you have to face. So while this runs, let me talk a little bit about Drupal 7. So uh, this repository actually works perfectly for Drupal 7 also. Uh, you would, your version numbers would not be 8.0, for example, over here, 8. star. It will probably be 7. star. Right? And it, it, it still works out of the box. Um, uh, your uh, your paths would be different, of course. You can't use docroot slash libraries or docroot slash modules. You would be having something like slide slash all modules over here because Drupal 7 looks for contrib modules in another directory, right? Um, so all that, okay, I think it's done. And uh, we should be seeing the rules module in the contrib directory and in the UI. So uh, that's basically about it. If you have any questions at this point, let me know. I just have a few more notes to go over because this is actually a very a new thing. Um, uh, if you're familiar with Composer, you would probably use this. And I would anyway encourage you to start using this for your Drupal 8 projects. Drupal 7, um, chances are that if you're still working on Drupal 7, you probably don't have the CI infrastructure which runs Composer installed on uh, packaging and all that. Uh, so uh, I, I won't so, uh, recommend, uh, so, uh, recommend this uh, so strongly for Drupal 7 projects, um, even though it can work. I have used this before. Um, but still, one of the fundamental things of this is that you would not commit your vendor directory. Um, and um, if you're committing a vendor directory, then there's no difference. You know, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, it, your workflow is pretty much the same. But the whole point of having a system like this is that you don't commit your dependencies. And you, you can then rest assured that Whatever you do, you're not, uh, you, your developers cannot, by mistake, commit uh, changes to the contrib uh, files, uh, any dependencies uh, such as Drupal or any of the modules. Uh, that's the whole point. That's the whole separation. And of course, uh, it also handles the version uh, updates and everything. Over here, if, uh, if, there, are, if there is a new version, uh, I just have to say Compose Update. It will look into all the, uh, all the components. And it'll still follow the version rules. Uh, so it'll, it'll still follow that, for example, Bootstrap, it'll still look at 8.3. something. Uh, so if I'm using 8.3.10 right now, it'll upgrade to 8.3.11 or so on. It'll, not, uh, it'll, not, it'll go to 8.4 also, but it'll not go to 9. So it'll not upgrade blindly. Your rules are still followed. And um, all the upgrades are done very easily. Uh, and your log file is updated with that. So if you're committing your log file, it will get all the updated dependencies on uh, on the on your production or, or your deployment. So this will probably take time. Yeah, Drupal because it has a whole chain of dependencies. You know, it like if you open the vendor directory over here, it's huge. Um, you can see there are so many dependencies over here. So um, it takes little time for Drupal projects. Uh, but it's actually faster if you're, this, this is only one time operation, you know, once you run, uh, once you have the log file, it's actually very quick. And while this is still going on, let me talk about the last thing. Um, so if you noticed on uh, packages page, there is a notice over here. 
that basically it's scheduled to be deprecated in January 2017, or when the official package repository from Drupal.org is ready. So this is actually somebody uh, contributed. Uh, you know, somebody built this. Uh, it's not official Drupal.org infrastructure. Um, it is uh, somebody built this, uh, you know, because they wanted to st get started using Compose, and then a lot of people pitched in, and it is what it is today. Um, but of course, then uh, since Composer is so important, and you know, it, this will be the default mechanism of all Drupal projects uh, in near future. Of course, uh, Drupal Association is also interested in uh, maintaining this, and uh, that is why Drupal.org is launching this uh, package repository, which is currently in beta. And uh, so which says that it's, uh, it's encouraging you to transition from the Drupal packages, uh, but it's not usable yet. Uh, on the other hand, Drupal packages, I would say that it is, uh, it works, it works fairly well. And uh, if you, you can't go wrong with it. So you can keep using uh, Drupal packages and then switch on the repository events that is deprecated. The, re the only thing that there are two things that change. The URL of the repository changes, uh, of course. So uh, over there you had Drupal packages .org. Over here you're using something. Uh, you're using this format: packages .drupal .org slash eight. So if you're working with Drupal eight project, you're going to use uh, packages .drupal .org slash eight. For Drupal seven, you would be using packages .drupal .org slash seven. And consequently, your versions, uh, your actual project versions, won't have uh, uh, that eight dot prefix. Uh, so over here, you can see if I need token module uh, in the Drupal packages repository, you would uh, be using 8.1.x dev, uh, like you can see over here. So I'm not using uh, token over here directly. So by the way, token is used, but it's not directly in here. Uh, it is one of the dip recursive dependencies. But over here, like, let's say 8.3.x dash dev, uh, because I'm looking for 8.x version. Over here, you don't need that eight dot uh, uh, um, that prefix over here because your repository is completely different for Drupal eight and Drupal seven. So these are the only two differences between these two repositories. The rest of the thing they they give the exact same output. Um, your uh, modules are placed in the correct location because of this installer paths. And uh, there is also a functionality for merge plugin for your custom modules. So if your custom modules are using Composer or JSON. Like mine is uh, the module I have written for this uh, site, custom module. It, it needs a third party component. That's how all the components are going to be built in future, all the modules. So uh, if, if you're using Drupal Commerce, for example, um, Drupal Commerce components depend on PHP components. Uh, so you, if you want to use Drupal Commerce, you have to install it with Composer. There is no other way. Uh, so similarly, this particular module, I'm requiring a client called uh, it's my own client. Uh, I've written a, a PHP version for it, uh, Drupal API client, and this module is just like a wrapper on top of that. And many people are actually following this whole thing, uh, like like I said, Drupal Commerce. And uh, this particular component goes into vendor directory. Uh, you can see it over here in vendor. Uh, but the module itself is in uh, modules slash custom directory. And uh, to get it inside my project, I use this merge plugin. And I, I think you know we'll not go too depth uh, too deep into it uh, because it's it's kind of an advanced uh, topic. Uh, but if you have any questions about that, I can take it offline. Uh, like I said, I'm available on Twitter. Uh, uh, I, uh, email. I'm very slow on email, so I would encourage you to uh, contact me on Twitter if you need anything. And that's about it. Let's see if oh no, this is still oh, thank going. Thank you on. so much, Uzain. We have about ten minutes, which we can still use for question answer. Or okay, yeah, sure. if you have time. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, that's how we plan. Forty-five minutes and fifteen minutes for questions. So, so any questions? Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, Hussein, this is Mandakni here. So, like, hi. if we are hi, if you we are upgrading the core, core, yeah. Drupal core. So, mm -hmm. should we write direct from command line, or we should uh, change here and then, uh, like, uh, instead yeah. of uh, eight point zero, we have to upgrade core eight point. 1.8 or 9. Okay. So okay. What's, up, what's the right approach? So the right approach would be uh, depending on what you what your application needs. So like I said, uh, the application you're building, the website you're building is not Drupal. It is using Drupal. 
right? Mm -hmm. So if your application, if your website needs a specific function of 8.1, <laughs> okay. okay, then go and change over here and then run composer update. Okay. Okay. But if you're just upgrading because 8.0 is no longer supported, if, if that's the reason you're upgrading, mm -hmm. then don't change it over here. Okay. So the versioning rules, the, the best practice for these rules are that uh, you always define the minimum version that your application can work with. Uh, no, uh, so like, uh, so, uh, like uh, take a scenario. I have a Drupal core 8.1.7. Uh, now latest yeah. is 8.1.9. Now I need to upgrade. Okay. So yeah. I, I have multiple scenario like I can download from Drupal.org and overwrite mm -hmm. or I yeah. can run the composer or I can like uh, modify this file uh, and then run the composer. So you would not modify this file in that case. So again, that's what I'm saying. The, the question here is to you. Uh, do you need new functions in 8.1.9? Uh, no, really is, just I want to upgrade because it's giving the warning again and again. So because latest yeah, so, version is this, so just I want to upgrade. I don't need any new the, functionality. Yeah, then you would run composer update. You would not change the composer JSON file. Okay, so best practice is run from like uh, uh, say just now you uh, install rules. Right now it's mm -hmm. in dev, but uh, tomorrow if it's uh, going in alpha, so instead yeah. of uh, uh, modifying here dot composer. Yeah. We should run from command line. No, I would modify it in uh, a Composer over there because I don't need dev releases any longer. Now I want to stick to stable releases. OK. Right? So mm -hmm. uh, then I would modify in my Composer or JSON so that it always picks up stable releases. OK. okay. okay. Because tomorrow, if I'm, if I'm still using dev over here, and tomorrow there's a new dev release, mm -hmm. which I don't okay. need, Okay, mm -hmm. it'll update anyway. I, I don't need that, right? I don't need. I, I want to be on stable channel. So dev is like you know you should use very cautiously, cautiously. Uh, like the warning on the Drupal.org web page itself that uh, dev releases are for experimental use. You know, don't use it in production. Right. But of course we use it in production because we need it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know the uh, uh, risks. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, over here in Composer or JSON, if there's a similar caution, you know, if you're using it, uh, be sure why you're using it. If there is a reason to use dev release. Go ahead, you have it. Mm -hmm. But if you can get off the dev release and switch to stable as soon as you can. Okay, okay. So like now, if so like if, if you I need, have a stable, uh, I should run from command line. If uh, I want to just, uh, I mean, I want to specifically use for dev, then modify it here, and or maybe just yeah. run from there itself, right? It's, yeah. If you're mm -hmm. just running a regular update, if it's not a change in your application, just run composer update. That's it. If you just want to keep up with the updates, that's all. Mm -hmm. uh, in that Thank case, you. just run composer update on command line. We have just one more question. Uh, okay. Hi, Usain. I am Arun. Hi. Unimity. I have a doubt on removing the windows from composer. Once I need to install a Apache Solar module for the Drupal 8, I need okay. some packages, windows packages. So I included the packages on the composer.json and run it down. And it will be installed on my Drupal. And later I think I have no need the Apache Solar. Then I will remove the module from my end. Yeah. Then what yeah. will be happen to the composer? So I need to remove the composer, the package, and again run out. Or it will be kept the files on. No, it will remove it from vendor. But the truth is it doesn't matter. So uh, actually, for that you have a, a shortcut command called composer remove. Uh, so if I if I don't need something, I, I can just say composer remove Drupal slash rules, and it will it'll remove all the files from wherever it had downloaded. Okay. So uh, in this case, it'll remove it from composer JSON also, and uh, it disappeared here, and it'll remove it from the directory also. So once the command completes, you'll see it disappear from contrib directory. Um, so it takes care of that, but it shouldn't matter anyway because you're not going to commit it anyway, right? I mean that's the best practice. Don't commit your rules directly, or don't commit your contrib or dependencies. And on the on the production uh, uh, production server, you will it will never have it. Does that answer the question? Mm, okay, the one more thing is um, in yeah. the package uh, package or JSON, we need to edit the Drupal. Default package or JSON, or we can put some other files. So run the composer file. I'm sorry, you mean composer or JSON, right? Uh, yeah, composer JSON. Is okay. Right way to edit the default file, or we 
can create one more combo one more file or run it on there so uh, yeah the composer of json you seeing on screen right now that is the one which was created by the template you know i pointed to that uh, template on github um, it is created from there so yeah this is the place to edit you should not edit any other composer or json files you should not edit for example in core directory you shouldn't edit that one because that's your component okay, okay. drupal slash core is your component you not edit that composer or json you will only edit your applications composer or json that's it no. so again you know that's another problem in using drupal slash drupal because it, now there are two composer or json files which are actually both part of drupal and you will it will actually be confusing which composer or json to edit so that's one of the, another reason you should never use drupal slash drupal always use drupal slash core with this drupal uh, scaffold plugin mm, okay okay thanks i know I, i understand it might be a bit too much to take in uh, you know all the scaffolding and there are a lot of new concepts over here uh, but they'll settle in over time and i'm of course if you have any questions uh, you can always tweet me okay thank you so much hussain for taking uh, time out of your saturday and spending it with it's us my pleasure you're welcome you're very um, welcome we hope we can do many more such sessions and get uh, uh drupal 8 more more of drupal 8 knowledge from you shared with uh, some of us here thank you so much it's nice of you to see thank yeah. you everyone thank you everyone for listening and i'll pass on all the links uh, bye everyone could you see us i mean could you see the uh, room here i can't because if i was sharing my screen uh, <laughs> uh now i was seeing the screen right yeah now i can see you yeah so we are about 20 of us here from uh, different companies like what shivadi said what he said uh, yeah. 20 young boys have come on a saturday to uh, listen to drupal so we are very excited for the audience as well thank you everybody yeah. thanks everyone for listening bye